Hello, hello. I am Karen Jean-François, and this is the Women in Data podcast, a podcast where every other week I interview some of the most inspiring women working in data. They discuss how data is used in various industries, share their knowledge and experience in the field, and equip you with tips to help you overcome challenges on your career and feel great. Let's get straight to it. I am joined today by Zandra Moore, co-founder and CEO of Pan Intelligence. Passionate about entrepreneurship, Zandra joined a government task force to help increase the chances of women starting, growing and scaling their businesses. In this episode, she shares her journey to founding her own business as a woman and a mother as well as the challenges that she faced along the way and what helped her succeed. Hi, Zandra. Welcome to the Women in Data podcast. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you today. And you've got me with a stuffy nose. That's, <laughs> that's what happens when my body decides to take revenge for me pushing it past its limit, I guess. Oh, it's so lovely to be here. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll get through it with a stuffy nose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited about the topic we're going to discuss today. We're going to talk about entrepreneuria, especially when it comes to female entrepreneurs and female leads. But before we get into that, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Andra Moore. I am the CEO and founder of data analytics software business. We essentially help technology companies, software businesses improve their in-app data insights, reporting, data visualization and machine learning. So uh, based in Leeds in the North of England. Oh, <laughs> that sounds really great, actually. Like you're in a very exciting space, I guess. So you did mention that you run your own business and because of the topic we're going to touch on today, I'm really curious to hear about when you decided that this is what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be an entrepreneur, have your own business and how did you get to that point? Yeah, so I think lots of entrepreneurs are accidental. I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs at all. In fact, nobody had their own business. They were all employed by organizations. I found myself working in technology because I had an amazing mum at home that got into tech by accident also, um, <laughs> just applying for a job in a newspaper. Uh, I ended up working in selling servers to businesses and computers to businesses. Then she ended up selling the internet and then the cloud and all sorts of amazing stuff very early in her, in the IT sector's sort of evolution. So I kind of grew up with this role model at home. So when I left school, I just wanted to be my mum, really. So I went and straight into the tech sector. I was really excited by all the opportunity that really tech could create. So started really in software and worked my way up to a sort of sales director role, commercial roles, and found myself at 29, having my first child very shortly after, trying to return to work in a very kind of stressful and pressured role on a part-time basis it was difficult. And there wasn't as many options as there is today for flexible working. So I made the decision that my husband would continue with his career and I would step back a bit for the family. And that was really the trigger for me because I was terrified of losing touch with the tech sector that moves super fast. And when you spend a bit of time out of it, you do lose your confidence because of the pace of change and the language changes. So much changes really quickly. So I decided to become self-employed, sell my time to other startup software businesses to help them using my skills that I'd learned through working in the software sector to help startups really get off the ground with their sales, their marketing, take their product to market, their proposition and messaging. And that was great for me because it helped me to flex that around my family and I could choose the hours and days that I worked and choose the customers I worked with. And that was the start really of me becoming an entrepreneur because self-employment was out of necessity to just keep my hand in and keep using my skills and keep involved in the sector, but on my terms for my family. I then found my two kids were going into school and I really wanted to go and work in the tech sector on a more full-time basis, but I got the kind of bug of being self-employed. And <laughs> I was also working with lots of startups that were super exciting and with CEOs and thinking, I'd like a piece of that. And I'd really like to actually be running my own business, not just selling my time, which is what I was doing. And it's just one of my clients. One of my clients was a product in another company. Pan Intelligence was a product in another company. It was very early. My CTO and co-founder was building it and we had an opportunity to buy the product. Basically, I said, I'd like to buy it. And we did. And we spun it out as a separate business in 2014. So 
it was really just taking that first step out of kind of employment into self-employment that helped me to be open to opportunities to build my own company and my own technology business. It's a bit of a happy accident, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like one. And I guess so thinking, reflecting back on it, you see it as a happy accident. But at the time when you had to make this decision of stepping back from the workforce and because there was not the flexibility that was allowing you to go back to work and also look after your kids and all that stuff it must have been very stressful and I know I have a lot of friends at the moment who are thinking about what should I do should I go back to work or even the ones asking oh can I have kids what is it going to do with my career but now flexibility is a bit different and I love the fact that actually for you it was an opportunity to do something else and something that you're thriving in, I want to say, because now it's been almost 10 years that you run this business, that you purchase the product, as you mentioned. And you're definitely a role model, just like your mom was a role model for you. You're definitely a role model now for the coming generations of women working in tech. So yeah, <laughs> well done. Thank you. And I think you were talking about barriers and that kind of challenge for women about to lean into that kind of scary world of becoming a parent right that's hard enough <laughs> you know there's no rule back for that either but it is hard in the sort of tech and data industries I mean the, the company I run is a data company and it's a technology business and a data business but I think part of thinking about that challenge when I was faced with it for me was just a deep love of what I do and not wanting to lose that because I knew it was a huge part of who I was I was prepared to fight for that alongside being a mum and just knowing that I didn't want to lose something I really loved was enough to kind of motivate me to find a way through it. And I think if you do love something, there's always a way. <laughs> I just got to keep yourself open, open to finding that path and not always think the path's obvious straight away. The path sometimes finds you. If you keep doing the things you love, it, you'll find a way. I love that. I have a few quotes from the podcast that I call my wall quotes. And this one is definitely <laughs> going there. <laughs> I love it. So you touched on barriers and challenges so being a parent was one of them what other challenges did you have to overcome in your journey so I think there's quite a few that come from just trying to get how to put this a sense of putting other people's views and biases of you to one side so that they don't become a barrier you absorb right that's hard I do think in tech and in data you know and this is the reason you have this podcast right is a gender challenge for us that we always feel we have to work that little bit harder prove ourselves a little bit more being the only woman in a room often is always going to create a dynamic where you don't feel you're quite in the club or you're quite included in the same way and I think that's just a truth really of what a lot of women face and I faced that through my career and just trying to put that to one side and ignore it and not let it dominate your feeling or your confidence or your sense of value is hard and, and always a bit of a battle so I think just always being aware that these things are barriers but not letting them be my limiter because yeah. you know that's one thing I would say and I, I think being in the north is quite interesting from a a lot of investment and a lot of advisory support is based in London, especially the specialist support for businesses like mine. So when we were raising money and when we were building and we needed the capital to grow and when you're finding talent, it's just we don't have the same choices around investors, the same specialist advisors or even the same kind of maybe breadth and depth of talent here. So we've had to work a bit harder on growing our own talent because we didn't have the same talent pipelines. And we've also had to work a lot harder at getting in front of investors because we're not surrounded by them. And, you know, Leeds is, feels a long way from London to a lot of investors, right? Wrongly, but it is. And I think that's changed a lot in the last three or four years. But certainly pre-pandemic, the kind of north felt a long way from the south. And because of remote working and everybody getting used to doing calls with people from all over the world, every day, all day, those barriers seem to have come down. And I think it's nice to see that investors and advisors are not allowing geography to be a limiter for getting involved with businesses. So I think it has been a barrier, but it's changed a lot. I want to say that it's very sad that it took a pandemic and a national lockdown to remove this barrier, really. But at least we're there now. Hopefully it's going to stay. 
I think it will. I think it will. <laughs> and in terms of female founders, obviously you did mention the problem with putting these limiting beliefs aside and not letting the fact that in the tech space, it's very male dominated. So letting that fact stop you from trying to get to where you want to be. So putting all this aside, but I would like to discuss the barriers that there are for women founders, particularly what you've observed in your years of being a founder and an entrepreneur, but also what's being done to address this, because this is a space you are very active in. And I feel like it would be great if you could share that with us. So I'm fortunate I was invited to be part of a task force, government task force, which is all about women-led high growth enterprises. And it's really interesting because it really makes you realise beyond your own experiences and the barriers you face, just what some of the broader challenges are. Just for some data points, there's 5.6 million businesses in the UK, of which only 38,000 are high growth. So the ones that are going to become sustainable large organisations employing lots of people. Only 13% of those have female founding teams and only 7% of capital goes to those female founded teams and when I say 70% of deals only 1% of the actual capital goes to them so a very small amount of money is fed into female founders and you have to ask yourself the question why and there's a couple of reasons one is the investment ecosystem is predominantly run by men it's predominantly men that are deploying capital and by our human nature we're more likely to trust and believe or feel or relate to things that are most familiar to us. So yeah. it's not surprising that sort of men invest in men, right? That's just the way human nature works. So we do need more women to be at the other side, right? We need them to be sort of the ones putting capital and investing into businesses. But actually, the reason we have so many men investing is because they're the ones that have created the wealth, right? So you need more women to become founders and become successful to create wealth to become those people investing in businesses so how do we do that so the, the question for me is where do female founders have come from and when you look at it 24 percent of all female founded businesses come through accelerators and incubators why is that well that's because in my experience men are more likely to know other entrepreneurs than women as a, as a woman, most of my friends are not entrepreneurs or run businesses. Most of them are working for their organizations or they have families and they're choosing to work part time. So by our very nature of the not being many of us, we don't necessarily have those networks organically in our lives, whereas men do. And that peer group is massively important because it's where you go to for that support, that guidance, that confidence, that advice. You know, how would you do this? Do you know someone who? That support can get you off the ground much faster and help you to kind of accelerate over those barriers and hurdles that you face when you're growing a business. So what you're saying is it's only 22% that comes from accelerator and incubator. So 22% of female founders. And how does that compare to men? Do you have the stat? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. So there are more, as a proportion of the total number, more women come through accelerators than men as a proportion of the total. Okay. And that's because I don't think men rely as much on accelerators and incubators to have the peer group to be able to go and start a business and found a business. Okay. They've already got that in their organic networks. So more women come through accelerators and incubators because they need that established peer group to be able to lean on and work together with to build the confidence and have that kind of support community to kind of take those big steps that you need to take when you're setting a business up. I just think it's part of our society that women have not had access to things like grassroots team sports like boys have had. And team sports can be a fundamental way that a lot of young men and boys create peer groups that are outside of school. When I see successful entrepreneurs, they'll talk about their rugby mates that they met through school, right? And or they'll talk through their, their football or, you know, whatever it might be. So there's lots of things in society where we need to bring women and girls together so they have those peer groups if they want to be able to kind of move into spaces where perhaps they're not currently represented leadership female founders a female footballer right playing for England all of this comes from supporting some level of grassroots and for me grassroots for female founders is those accelerators those incubators and those networks where you can bring people together to have peer support and learning and we've got to work at the grassroots as well as solving some of the problems in, in investment too yeah I definitely hear that 
And I'm sorry, I had understood it the wrong way around. So now it's clear. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know what we're saying here and that's very interesting and I feel like over the last few years and as well accelerated with the pandemic communities have grown so much and I myself rely a lot on communities and seeing how that supports me in my career development and my personal development as well so I can only imagine what it does when you're trying to start your business which could be maybe seen sometimes as a bit lonely Yeah, and also just having people that have networks you can lean on, right? So we we all have, do you know someone who? The more people you trust that understand what you're trying to do, the quicker they can point you in the direction of people that are going to help you. And that's really important to fast track that kind of relationships. You know, those referrals and those introductions can be the fastest way to saving your time and being effective as an entrepreneur or a leader. Yeah, definitely. So... I guess you did mention the fact that we need to address these at the grassroots and lots of things are being done at the moment. And you are talking about also everything that it starts from our upbringing. So joining team sports and, well, maybe not team sports, <laughs> but or the activities. Whatever I say, it's about role models, right? So you talked about role models before and it's like, you know, how many of our young people are seeing role models in their schools coming in and talking to them about data and technology and how many of those look like them and sound like them? How many of them are women or from ethnic minority backgrounds or whatever that might be, right? It, it, it's We need to make sure that role models are visible as early as possible as well as those networks as well so there's lots of things that we can do to try and change that trajectory of seeing more women sort of leading and running successful organizations so yeah lots to do yeah definitely a lot to do <laughs> <laughs> but there's great stuff happening right you know there's some really fantastic initiatives that I'm involved with we have the D list in Leeds which is a diverse list of entrepreneurs just to make them more visible so that we do see more diversity on panels so that we do have more role modeling that represents the society we all want to be part of and the leadership that we all want to see we have more female investment funds led by women. We have Ada Ventures and we have Fund Her North, which is female kind of high net worth investing in female led businesses. We have grants that are specifically aimed at women from Innovate UK. And there's lots actually. So there is some great stuff happening to try and enable that grassroots, but there's a lot to do. Yeah. Yeah. And with what you just mentioned, so that links back to as well what you said about the fact that we needed more female who are bringing the capital so that female entrepreneurs can grow. So I guess what I would like to know and what you could share with our listeners are really your best advice for data professionals who want to start their own business and lead it as well. So you did mention the D list and you did mention the a few female network. So where can people get to these resources where they can find the information and what would be your best advice for women who want to start their business? From personal experience, the best thing I did was go out into my local community and find the networks where I could feel I was at home, where I felt that I could build relationships and start to build new connections with people that would help me to go on that journey. So I went to lots of kind of business networks locally. Not all of them felt like they were my tribe. I created one called Lean in Leads, which is a network of women that are kind of supporting each other to be whatever their idea of success is, right? Whether they're entrepreneurs or not. I've also part of female founder networks as well as female data founder network. (laughs) And the more you go out and start to look for these tribes, you will find those that are right for you and as you start to build those networks through that will come the advice and the guidance and support and the relationships that will help you to maybe take the steps that you're nervous of taking today because it can feel quite overwhelming going hey you know I really want to go on my own or I've got this great business idea it's like where do I start you're not going to get that from reading a government website or reading a book you're really not you will learn just by talking to others and hearing their stories and also people just saying hey go and do this, speak to this person, they'll help you, they'll help you. That's just honestly the best way to do it. And it's never easy to walk into a room on your own. I get that too. So the great thing about 
the network that you're in, this women in data network that you have, is that you don't have to walk into a room always alone. You can take somebody with you and then get to know people. And then the next time you go, you're not walking in alone. So I would say the number one thing is to go out and find your tribe and find the tribe of people that are going to help you to make that step. Yeah, and that's a really good advice. Thank you. I remember when I when I moved to London, as I was trying to settle in this new amazing place I, I was in, I was also trying to make friends and find a few groups of people I could relate to. So Women in Data was one of them. But I remember also joining a lean-in in London as well that was for entrepreneurs. And I felt a bit out of place because I wasn't starting a business. I just had an idea for charity for back home without really doing that much about it, just an idea. And as you said, you need to find your tribe and the group that resonates with you. But let's imagine someone like me who just maybe has an idea. Do you feel like it's good for them to join these kind of groups from the beginning or do they need to maybe nurture the the idea a bit more? Never wait to be ready because you never will be, right? So no idea is ever good enough because even as an entrepreneur, your business is never, never the thing that you wanted it to be. You're always working on it. You're always developing it. And therefore... It's a bit like if I go back to technology, you know, that minimum viable product, we're all MVPs as people. (laughs) We're never going to be the finished article. (laughs) And we're beautifully imperfect, all of us. So just being able to be comfortable with the fact that if you really, back to this point about if you really love it and it's really something you want and you don't want to lose it or you want to find it, just go out there and start talking to people about it because the more you start talking about something, I don't know if the book's a secret that people talk about, put it out in the universe and it will come back to you. So the more you start to go out there, talk to people, it's amazing what then comes and finds you and helps you to go on that journey. So don't try and have a beautiful business plan and a fully formed idea or even a really kind of structured deck even you don't need any of that you just need something that you're passionate about you can talk about and the rest will come from it so don't wait just go out this uh thank you this makes me laugh because it's so unlike me (laughs) i would just just go write it down to the smallest detail and then i will start talking about it and it's funny because when i had the idea of the podcast i was so excited about it that i did the opposite so usually i will just go have a full plan i'm a planner everybody who listens to the podcast will be tired of me saying that right now (laughs) but for the podcast i just thought oh let me just talk to women in data and see if we can do that without knowing what we were going to do and this is the project that works the best for now so (laughs) Yeah, I just have one thing that I personally want to know out of curiosity, and I'm pretty sure a lot would be happy that I asked that question. So you do have a background in sales, and one of the books I love is Unapologically Ambitious from Shelley Archambault, who is one of the few Black female CEO in the Silicon Valley. And like me, she's a planner, maybe a bit more than me, (laughs) definitely better at creating goals and sticking to them <laughs> to them <laughs> but she she says that when she was planning to become a ceo what she observed was that most of the ceos had come from a sales background so she decided early on in her career to go to sales so that will put her on the path to ceo you come from sales as well <laughs> so you were selling i think it was softwares that you mentioned that's right yeah. yes So is that something that you agree with? And if so, have you met anyone from a technical background leading a business? So I'm not a planner. (laughs) (laughs) And I've also read the book and it's an amazing book. And and she's phenomenal. I was astonished that she had got this really clearly defined (laughs) kind of, I'm going to start here. So it gets me there. I'm definitely somebody who kind of follows the path that I can only go so far on thinking how far forward I'm going to go because I do think sort of you play to your strengths and you have to adapt to different conditions in the market. Crikey, the last three years has taught us anything you have to adapt, right? That sometimes the best laid plans are just impossible to execute. So you have to kind of, as an entrepreneur, look far enough forward to know where you're heading, but be able to be 
tuned in and adaptive enough to take different paths quickly so that you don't go down the wrong rabbit hole. It's an interesting, so I'm a real believer in just getting out there and seeing what everyone tells you, you know, is this a good <laughs> idea or not, right? Is the people going to buy this? Are people going to do anything with it? You know, your podcast is brilliant. And, you know, you just had an instinct that you knew this was a good thing to do. And sometimes trusting that is the best thing we can do for ourselves. Your question about sales. I mean, I have massive imposter syndrome still. You know, it's really... I really have to sometimes stop when I go, oh my God, I'm a CEO. (laughs) I don't, like being a parent, I've got two teenage kids now. I didn't go into parenting having a clue what I was in for. And in fact, if anyone had told me, I probably wouldn't have become a parent. And I think the same sort of feels for being a CEO is that you kind of play to your strengths and you are who you are and you lean on your experiences and that's all you can do, right? You can learn and you can listen and you can work hard to adapt to the role of being a founder and a CEO but mostly it's just leaning on your strengths and your talents and your experiences that you've got as your resources so all I know is that being a sales-led CEO means that I'm probably more tuned into the market and the motion of getting a product to market than maybe a technical CEO might be but that said my co-founder is technical and I'm a massive fan of having co-founders right because when I think about strengths leadership and playing to your strengths you can't be all things you never will be you're only ever going to be able to play to your strengths and who you are and what you're good at so you must build a team around you of people that are different and better than you at things that you're never going to be good at and actually I think Sometimes when you've got sole founders, that's really hard because they're always going to be just the person that's at the top of the tree. And therefore, the business will always be directed very largely by their strength and talent. If you've got co-founder and you're both very different and you have different strengths and talents and the business is led by a broader range of strengths and talents. And for me, yes, I think my technical co-founder is brilliant, but we need each other. We can't do it without each other. So yeah, I think there's lots of technical founders that are successful, but I would imagine that they also have either a co-founder or a second or somebody that works very close to them that is very commercial and sales. So that's my experience. I couldn't do this alone as a sales CEO. I need the great team that I've got around me. Yeah. And would you say that would be your best advice for someone from a technical background who want to have their own business? It would be to have a co-founder. I mean, I'm talking just from my experience, right? So I think it's the best thing I could have done (laughs) because I know I'm not technical enough to have built the product that we have as well as we've built it. That my co-founder isn't commercial enough for us to be able to get it to market and build a sustainable high growth business that we have. So it works because of that. And therefore, if you're very technical, finding someone that can take your brilliant idea and make sure that it has value, is bought, seen, found, is huge. And I don't think the Elon Musks of this world who just seem to be able to turn the hand to everything are rare. And whatever you think of Elon Musk, most of us have limitations. (laughs) I have many. (laughs) And my children would tell you I have lots and lots of limitations. But yeah, if you know that commercial sales, marketing, go to market isn't your strength or your interest equally. You might be able to turn your hand to it, but if it's not your interest, find someone that loves your idea and your tech, or whatever it is you're building as much as you do and do it together. I think it's also nice to have a peer that you can lean on when it gets tough. You've got somebody that's sort of in the driving seat with you, which yeah. is great. And that actually sounds amazing and very useful and I can see how it's working but it's not an easy thing to do right to find someone who would be as passionate as you about the business that you're building and someone that would actually complement your skills so how would you find such a person that goes back to being self-employed I had lots and lots of clients that I was consulting for and there's many of them I would have never wanted to go into business <laughs> they were great from a client point of view but we would have never worked well together you know <laughs> for lots of good reasons you know I like them as people but not necessarily as a colleague close colleague so I think for me I was almost shopping around a bit and I knew because I was working with my co-founder Ken for a number of years actually as a consultant I just knew that the two of us together worked really well yeah And I knew we complimented each other. And I got so hooked on what we were doing and building. It resonated with me on a really core level. So it's data visualization and predictive analytics. And I'm dyslexic. And I find that making the complex simple is one of the best things for me. And how I learn best is the detail overwhelms for me. I get really overwhelmed in the detail. 
but you give me high level analysis and I can show you the direction of travel in a heartbeat. Mm. I can really taking data and turning it into insight and then action is what I'm great at. So he's the data engineer. He's the guy that can deal with the complexity of the data world. And I'm the one that can turn that into stories and insights that really change outcomes. And that's where we really balance each other out, actually, making the complex simple (laughs) in a data world, really. Thanks for sharing that. And to close the episode, is there any content that you listen to or even watch that helps you in your career or personal development? So I've got four things. So one's a book, Crossing the Chasm, which for anybody that has started or is starting a business and is thinking about going from being that small business to high growth business, that kind of phase of lifestyle business, this pays me a salary and I get to work for myself versus I want to employ lots of people and grow a company. Crossing the Chasm is a great book to understand what you need to do to go from small to growth, right? So that's a brilliant book for people thinking about if they have that ambition and they want to go on that journey, that's a great place to start. It's by Jeffrey Moore. I listen to the Get Latka podcast, but Get Latka for me is great because it's all about founders of technology companies and their founder stories. So if you're wanting to listen to lots of founder stories, their journey, how they've started, that's brilliant. So you and you can completely binge on that because he releases like two a day or something. It's crazy. Oh wow! And it's just full of founders of all backgrounds from all over the world, from all sectors, and lots of data businesses. So absolutely a go-to if you just want to. And also, it helps you to realise most people are pretty normal and haven't really started off mm-hmm. with a very detailed plan. <laughs> so don't worry about having a plan. And then the last two, Tech Crunch. If you want to find out the bigger players in the market around who's made it right and those are nice stories to read because you start to see where you might be able to take a business that you start and just how fast that can happen for people and how they believe they've got there so I like that it's always aspirational for me to read those stories and go that's where I'm heading and then last of a data point of view data catered which is Kate Strakakani is brilliant at sort of as an influencer and we've got listen out on the 12th November or afterwards because it'll be online will be data's not scary series I've got one slot but it's a whole group of people from the data industry talking about different parts of the sort of data ecosystem and and why we should not worry about it and there's some brilliant names on there so she does some great stuff but yeah Kate Strachani and data's not scary. Yeah, Katie is great. And I think this episode is going to come out after the Data is Not Scary series. And I think there is also, who is going to be there? The classification guru Mm -hmm. is in there as well, if I remember well. And there are a few data influencers there. So that's definitely one to check out. Thank you so much, Sandra, for joining me on the podcast today. It was a pleasure to be chatting with you. It's been wonderful. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Women in Data podcast. We will be back in a couple of weeks with a new guest. Until then, if you have two minutes, it would be great if you could leave us a rating or a review as it helps not only to make the podcast more visible, but also to enhance the content. If you don't want to miss the next episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on LinkedIn. And if you wish to, you can even register to the community for free. All you have to do is head to womenindata.co.uk. Have a great day.